there are few achievements in engineering and construction that carry as much weight as the title the largest, biggest, or longest. There's a reason I'm constantly referencing the Burj Khalifa rather than the Merdeka 118. And works like this, and by extension lives, rely on engineers going beyond the bounds of convention and prescriptive building codes to metaphorically venture forth and be willing to test limits. Even if the engineers are hypothetical, as is the case with science fiction, still, I find it interesting to think about what these larger structures might be and how they could be built. You think maybe he's compensating for something? <laughs> but before I spoil the subject, uh, go ahead, pause the video, and comment what you think the largest structure in science fiction might be. It's not the Barad Door from Lord of the Rings standing at 1500 meters, or the Tyrell Corporation headquarters from Blade Runner, so feel free to be surprised that the highest honor in science fiction goes to the big beautiful prison cell, the dome that houses the Truman Show, standing about 7 kilometers tall and 14 kilometers wide. Now I'm under no delusion that there aren't any larger supposed structures, the rings of the Halo universe come to mind, even many modern bridge or great wall projects might technically be larger, at least in some dimension. Or that some dork with a pencil drew a semicircle and claimed it to be a dome infinity plus one meters in diameter, but if I'm to consider standalone buildings founded on the Earth, this takes the cake. But uh, I want to go a bit further, uh, do some structural analysis, and see if I can get some schematic level design for Truman's Dome, and along the way, answer some questions like how the structural mechanics of domes work, uh, how does the movie present the megastructure, and what other solutions could have been used. All this to think about what it might take to achieve the title of the largest building in the science fiction world. All right, uh, now let's start with the basics. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how domes work, or maybe even more rudimentary than that, because a dome is just an arch structure rotated about its central axis. And this is a form that's been around since the beginning of architecture. And this makes some good sense given the building materials of the ancient world, which would be like bricks and stone, uh, materials that aren't good at resisting tension or pulling forces, but are great at resisting compression or pushing forces. And the arch or dome shape does this better than lintel or beam framing, acting mostly in compression by resolving a load path within the material profile. Now, how do we know what that load path is? Uh, the best way to visualize it is by picturing a chain or necklace hanging from two points. It has this parabolic shape as it droops down to the center, just under its own weight. And the same concept applies when loads are added. Uh, then flip that concept upside down, and the profile for the chain would be more or less the profile of the load path. The issue then becomes, what happens when the load path falls outside of the arch material? Well, that's when tension develops and those ancient building materials develop things like cracks, and ultimately becomes unstable. But part of the reason we're blessed with some ancient marvels like the Roman Pantheon, Hagia Sophia, or the Santa Maria del Fiore, in addition to the fact that they've been well maintained over the years, but their designs obviously keep these load paths within the profile of the dome, maintaining stresses that are mostly compressive using concrete, stone, and brick, and contributing to their longevity. Now that's not to say arches and domes don't resist tension forces, because they do. Even with well-proportioned designs, the flow of forces, while primarily in compression, especially in the vertical direction, if we think about the forces acting laterally, also called hoop stresses, these change from compression at the top to tension towards the bottom, as there is an outward thrust that develops. Which is why the Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, Italy, used iron chains which resist tension, at least a lot better than brick, and were embedded within the dome around the lower latitude lines, using metal as a tension reinforcing, much like rebar in modern concrete. Also, as an unsolicited and uh, unpaid ad, there's a really awesome book that goes deep into the Santa Maria story, engineering and construction, by Ross King called Brunelleschi's Dome, and it's a really great read. If you're interested in learning more about the largest dome from the 1400s up until modern times, I would absolutely recommend it. So let's close up the overview on the resolution of forces within the dome. Now, obviously, when lateral wind forces or snow loads, especially when they're unbalanced, 
can push a dome in ways that are irregular and counter to the strengths of the shape and can cause load paths to deviate from the material profile. In fact, a failure of this kind occurred when the CW Post Dome, part of the Long Island University, experienced heavy unbalanced snow loads and collapsed one night in 1978, so it is a very real failure mode. Although, this was a pretty different structure, not made of brick or concrete, but with steel latticework. And that brings up an interesting point. See, modern dome structures have gone away from some of the classic building materials like stone blocks, sorry architecture revivalist folks, and have instead opted for lightweight structures like steel space trusses, which can weigh as little as a few pounds per square foot compared to a stone or concrete, which may need to weigh dozens of times more per unit area. And steel has the ability to resist uh, tension loads, it's great at that, and at the expense of being susceptible to buckling or failure due to instability or compression forces, I mean you can't win them all. But I'd also be remiss if I didn't at least mention the geodesic domes as well. You may be familiar with the Epcot Center and the pioneering work of Buckminster Fuller, which take advantage of the strong shape of triangles, the strength of modern steel, and arranged in a manner that is incredibly efficient. So maybe that could be a good system for Truman's Hollywood overlords to use when building their megadome. Well, for all the hype and background we've given the concept, uh, what is the construction of the dome like in the Truman Show? We get about three whole frames of the dome, and if you blinked or were looking down at your phone while finding relevant clips for your YouTube video, you may have missed it, but it appears to be an incredibly large sheet metal dome with a few radial lines of additional stiffeners, or reinforcing, and these X grids so that you know it's metal. And being someone who stands on the shoulders of giants, uh, nerds before me determined that the dome is located somewhere in the Los Angeles area, and as previously mentioned, clocked the diameter at something like eight and a half miles or 14 kilometers. Though the town they used in the movie, like the actual set, is in Seaside, Florida, located a few miles west of Destin on the Gulf Coast and would only be a mile or two across. Uh, to get up to something like eight and a half miles in diameter, Truman's world would have gotten quite a bit bigger. So anyways, I decided to take that uh, pretty seriously and created a model for a similar dome using the simple Risa 3D software, which for some reason allows me to draw a 44,000 foot diameter structure. I, I appreciate their ambition. And with that, uh, went about the process for design, beginning with the general geometry and applying plates of varying thicknesses, starting off just by applying the self-weight of the steel and seeing how that goes. And I mean, it sagged, or to use the engineering jargon, deflected like 50 feet in the middle, which is a lot, though when compared to the overall span, we ended up with a deflection of about 1 900th of the length, which is about three times stiffer than code would mandate, and the plate stresses all appeared to be pretty manageable. But design done, right? Nope. Well, I noticed when looking closely at the deformed shape, some pretty non-linear behavior to say the least, and figured we needed some more structure. So I went about drawing in the stiffener ribs, which we kind of see, though I was finding that the stiffeners were pretty unstable, so I sized them up, still unstable, and again. So at this point, I decided to get into the material properties. Instead of the standard A36 steel, I decided to start bullshitting, using a material that's 200 KSI steel, which is strong but not unheard of, though I did modify the stiffness to be 100 times that of steel and 20 times stiffer than graphene, a, a super material in its own right. So feeling pretty good about my super steel, patent pending, I went back to look at how large we might need the stiffeners to be. And keep in mind, this isn't all that efficient of a design, but it does work. Though, as the saying goes, anybody can design a bridge that stands, it takes an engineer to design a bridge that barely stands. So with some whittling, the, the section size I settled on was a hollow tube 10,000 inches tall by 5,000 inches wide, and I'll spare you the metric conversion and say that these tubes could fit San Francisco's iconic Transamerica Tower vertically. Two of them across, and because it's triangular shaped, probably one upside down too. And on a system level, there could be some good material saving measures by adding in stiffeners and smaller intervals, additional hoops near the base could help with stability, all to help reduce the size of these skyscraper sized tubes. And for what it's worth, I also applied some wind loads, but the structure ended up being surprisingly rigid laterally, and I didn't bother with snow for this one, as the base snow load for Los Angeles isn't very high, believe it or not. And as far as the construction phase goes, I'll leave that to the means and methods of the contractor. 
but I assume it would be a volume of scaffolding so large and intricate it would basically be a nation-scale engineering project on its own. And something else that would be pretty critical to the design that I've kept in my pocket up to this point is the concept of thermal expansion. So steel and concrete both expand and contract at a ratio of 7.2 times 10 to the negative 6 percent per degree Fahrenheit of temperature change. To put that in a little more perspective, on a typical day in the dome we might see morning temperatures of 60 degrees Fahrenheit raising up to 90 in the afternoon for a differential of 30 degrees making the dome want to expand about 10 feet or 3 meters beyond its geometry each day, and even more so over the course of the year. But of course the structure is anchored to the ground, and well, something's gotta give, and it's usually not the foundations which would cause the structural members to tear themselves apart. Though sometimes I've heard slotted holes in steel connections can be used to tolerate thermal movements, but it's also said to cause a loud banging noise when the structure does expand. All right then, uh, now does a steel structure make sense for the Truman Dome? I mean, it's gotta be better than a brick one, but what other option is there? Well, what about inflated dome structures? Inflated structures are often used for sporting facilities to create a large open area within a relatively cheap structure when engineered by specialists. Using fabric held down by steel wires, it only takes a slight increase in standard air pressure, like a negligible 1% difference, to resist the vertical loading. And this would remain the same regardless of the size of the dome, as pressure is based per unit area, though the study needed for lateral movement is a much more complex finite element analysis, as neither fabric or steel wires have much if any bending resistance, plus there might need to be some good measures for monitoring holes in the fabric. Now, I've been throwing around the name, the largest building, but do you know what it is in the real world? Well, by area, it's actually the elongated muskrat development, the Tesla Gigafactory, based just outside of Austin, Texas. This squat, three-story building occupies over 230 acres of land, putting it on the scale of a small lake or reservoir. Even still, the Truman Dome would eclipse it by a factor of 170 times in area and 70,000 times over by volume. It's really on a different scale. And something a bit unstated in all of this is that a dome is inherently a column-free space with no interior supports, which of course is necessary in maintaining the illusion for Mr. Carey, unless the Truman Show's creative directors can come up with a good reason. Though, based on how uh, dedicated the director is, I have no doubt hidden columns could be chalked up to some goofy concept of science and Truman would be like, yeah. Sure, since it apparently took him 30 years to sniff out anything was up in the first place. Alright, now if you've been keeping up with the channel, first, thank you. I, I really do appreciate your continued support. And if so, you may recall that in a recent video on Neon Genesis Evangelion, I deferred the analysis of the Geofront Dome, which spans over 6 kilometers at a pretty steep angle, and supports what I presume is hundreds of meters of soil weight and structural steel, so let's dip back into that and see how that compares. So this is a case with a dome that's very heavily loaded, and what amounts to a hole in the ceiling, what with all the buildings that transition between the city above and the cavern below, uh, um, if you haven't seen that video yet, or Neon Genesis, uh, go ahead and do yourself a favor and check it out. But having a hole in the roof of a dome isn't all that problematic. The 2000 year old Pantheon got away with it because although there is a large compressive stress that wants to be resolved there, the ring surrounding that opening can essentially act like a 360 degree arch which is great at resolving evenly distributed loads. That said, I'm just going to move past the opening and discuss the modeled results. Uh, taking into account the shallow arch shape with an average of 10,000 pounds per square foot applied, we'd have issues with stiffness using man-made materials and would quickly find ourselves with a collapsed dome. But similar to the Truman case, if we get to assume some slightly stronger alien tech, the results might only need a 60 foot thick dome using a material about twice as stiff as a graphene would be. Alright, Dan with that, I feel pretty good about putting a bow on this one. After it's all said and done, I was actually kind of surprised with how close the general concept of the enormous dome is. The last time we analyzed a structure that big, the demands were millions of times greater than conventional materials, rather than a hundred or so. Maybe if some big brain billionaire can convince themselves it's a good idea, well, maybe, never mind. Well, fun stuff, I uh, hope you learned something, and if you did, let me know below, or if you have other videos that you'd want to see. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Adios.